دخيل ليس يحمي الديار مثل النار وانفضي عنك كل قيد وقوم كي تقود جمعنا للثار وانفضي عنك كل قيد وقوم كي تقود جمعنا للثار للسبيل في حمك يرقم فجرا وينادي وينادي متى يفاك ساري وينادي متى يفاك ساري نزقهم يا كتائب الاحرار والفضي العيش في ديابنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور مكتفاتها وكل مكتفة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We begin by praising Allah and we thank Him and we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the abd of Allah, he is the worshipper and the slave of Allah and he is the messenger of Allah. After that, the best speech is the book of Allah. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced into the religion. And every matter that is newly introduced into the religion of Islam is an innovation. And all of those innovations in the religion, they are misguidance. And everything that is misguidance is going to be going away from the straight path. And whatever goes away from that straight path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, its destination is going to be in the fire. Today, we want to talk about the deception of the dunya, the deception of the world. You see, most of us, and I say most of us. I don't just say that meaning most of the human beings, but I include actually, in reality, even the Muslims. Most of mankind really think and live as if this is the life. They think and live as if this life was the real life. As if when death comes to us, if death comes to us, because some people are so deceived by the life of this world. They're so deceived by it that they actually imagine that they are going to live forever. They actually imagine that they are not going to die. Although in front of them, the reality of death is everywhere. They see the graveyards, they see people dying, their friends die, their relatives die. But somehow they imagine that they're not going to die. I remember when I was young, when I was young, 17, 18, 19. The idea of death, the idea of death seems something so far, so distant, so remote, that I couldn't imagine that that was going to happen. Death seemed, a, you know, it wasn't even a reality. It was not even a reality. How many people think like that? My father. My father is 82 years old. 
He's 82 years old. He still plays tennis. He could probably beat half of you. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> he could actually probably beat three quarters of you, actually. <laughs> he can still give me a good game of tennis. I'm a good tennis player. Alhamdulillah. 82 years old. And my dad said to me, for the first time in his life, he feels mortal. Think about that. For the first time in his life, he is beginning to feel mortal. In other words, he's going to actually starting to realize for the first time in his life that actually he might die. This is what he says. This is what before, it wasn't an issue. When he was young, he thought he was going to live forever. Almost like a god. god. But now he's getting a bit old. And he can't move quite as fast as he used to move. He's beginning to realize now that death is going to come sometime, someplace, and it's not so far away. And some people don't even realize that. They keep on living their life as if they are never ever going to die. Because they have been deceived by this world. The world has deceived them and the world has fooled them. In fact, the world has been described by the Prophet Isa and actually this is something the Prophet ﷺ told us that Isa ﷺ said it's not something that's in the Injil that the world is like a old woman an old, old, ugly woman but she has adorned herself she has put on makeup she has put on clothes, she has made herself look beautiful, and she is inviting people to come and make Zina with her. But really she's ugly and old. And if you just took away that makeup, or the moment you get close, you really realize how old and ugly she is. But she, invite, she invites people and so many people accept it. This is the similitude, brothers and sisters. May Allah have mercy on you in this dunya. And then what is the similitude of the person who has given themselves to this old woman? The people who are actually as if it was described fornicating with this old woman. These are the people who have given themselves to this dunya. And some to the extent that they love it. Love. This is a word to think about. What is love? What is the reality of love? Think about the people and the things you love. And why do you love them? You love your parents. You love your children. You love your car. People love things. Why do they love them? We love our parents because they gave us comfort. They gave us security. When we were sad, they made us feel good. And they gave us direction in life and they nurtured us. And these are the things that produce love. And with that love comes and this is something that come, comes hand in hand with love, is obedience. Love and obedience come together. Love and obedience come together. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, when there are some people who claimed, we love Allah, we love God, we love Allah. This is the claim they made, the mushrik Arabs, they said, okay, you Muslims, oh Muhammad, you say you love Allah, we love Allah too. Because the, the Mushrik Arabs, they believed in Allah, they believed Allah existed, they believed He was the Lord of the creation, and some of them claimed to love Him, as do some Jews and some Christians 
and Hindus and Sikhs, they claim to love Allah. So Allah, He, he, he revealed an ayah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet, Kul, in kuntum tahibbun Allah, fatabiyuni yahbibkum Allah. Say, O oh Muhammad, if it is true that you love Allah, fatabiyuni, follow me, and then Allah will love you. So here we find that love is connected to following, obeying. I once knew a man. I still know him, who was married to a very good and religious and pious woman. However, this man, when he got married to a second woman, as it is halal in Islam to do that, despite what the ignorant people say, Living in the 21st century does not make haram what Allah made halal. What Allah made halal 1400 years ago is halal today. And what Allah made haram then is haram today. And if anybody says that the sharia or anything from Islam is not valid today and it's not applicable today, then they have disbelieved in what Allah has revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this man, seeking to follow the sunnah and seeking to do something that was from the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, he took a second wife. And his first wife was very, very, very jealous. In fact, she was, so, she was pathologically jealous. Her jealousy actually started to make her insane. She started to become delusional. She started to imagine every single thing that her husband did was in some way to make her life difficult and to make her co-wife's life more easy. And although this brother tried everything, even to the extent that he began to oppress his second wife to try and make his first wife happy, but none of this worked. And she proceeded to make his life more and more and more unpleasant. Although at the same time, she claimed that she loved him. So the, this brother got to a stage where he said, what sort of love is this? Who needs love like that? What sort of love is it where everything you want, the person doesn't do it, and everything you hate, the person does it? How can you describe it as love when a person makes your life entirely unpleasant? You can keep that love and you can take it because I don't want it. That's what he said. So he divorced her. He didn't care for that type of love. And none of you would care for that type of love because it's love without any real meaning. Love means doing the per thing that person loves. If you love someone, you make them happy and you do the things that make them happy. That's what love means. If you don't do that, your claim to love is false. So if you love God, you will follow the Prophet wasallam because that is what Allah wants. If you claim to love Allah, your claim is useless and false and Allah has no need of it. And like this man who divorced his wife, Allah will have nothing to do with those people on the Day of Judgment. They will find everything is useless except those people whose love was true. And their love was true, and how do we know their love was true? Is because they made ittida of Allah's beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is how we prove Allah for Allah by following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whoever claims to love Allah and does not follow the Prophet is a liar. And their love is not love. 
to something else. So that is love. Love means following. So now back to the dunya, back to the world. Some people love the world. They love the world because to them they find comfort in it. They find happiness in it. They find, as they imagine, security in it. So they love the world. And what the world demands from them, what this haggard old woman who has made herself up, what she demands, they give. And what does the world demand? What is it that the world demands from you? What is it that this old haggard woman wants from you? She wants something that in fact is in reality haram, an abomination. That you should disobey Allah. That you should disobey the commandments of God. <coughs> what the world demands from you is that you should do everything to obtain it. And so the lover of the world, the person who loves this world, the person who loves this dunya, is one who does not care whether their money is halal or haram. They don't care whether the way they obtain the dunya is through the lawful means or the unlawful means. So when you see someone taking riba, when you see someone selling that which, har that which is haram and dealing in that which is haram, then you know that this person is a person who is fornicating with the dunya, who is a lover of the world, and their heart is attached to the world. <coughs> they have submitted and surrendered to it. But what a deception that is. What a fool that person is. What a misguided and blind individual that person is. Because if that person had taken any time to look, they would have found in fact that the world is something revolting, something disgusting, something that makes the stomach churn. Because beneath the thick lipstick and the makeup is an old, haggard, ugly thing. So the world you see, brothers and sisters, is a deception. But many people have sold their souls for the world. They gave up Islam for the world. They gave up following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the world. And these are the people who have made a useless and a rubbish bargain. They didn't make a bargain, they made a trade. And they made a trade that is a great loss. A great loss. They sold something very precious for something totally useless. This is what they did. They sold pearls for dung. They sold diamonds for dirt. This is what the people have done. And it has come to the extent that you find what has taken place today, what is taking place today, is what the Prophet wasallam said would take place. What the Prophet ﷺ said would take place. That a man or a person would wake up in the morning a believer and go to bed a kafir. They would go to bed a kafir and wake up a believer. This is how it would be. In the morning kafir, in the believer, in the evening believing. In the evening believing, in the morning disbelieving. 
because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, they will sell their deen, they will sell their religion for a miserable price. They will sell their religion. Sell it. They will sell their deen for some miserable, pathetic price. And this is exactly what you find. Exactly what you find. People ready to sell their religion for a miserable price. But the life of the world, brothers and sisters, is really just an illusion. It is a small, temporary moment in our existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave the similitude or the example of this dunya in the Qur'an and you'll find this in Surah Al-Kahf. The, the, the world is like, the, this life of this world is like the rain which Allah sends down from the sky. The life of this world is like the rain which Allah sends down from the sky. And it waters the crops. And the crops they grow. And then the sun comes. And the sun dries the crops. And then the wind blows and scatters it like dust. That is it. Like rain comes down, it's absorbed, the sun comes, the wind blows, and it's scattered like dust. That's this world. Nothing. Just nothing. It is come and it is gone. How is it then that we put our faith in these things? Only those people who are like cattle, who are like sheep, like cows and donkeys and pigs and sheep. These are the people who just busy themselves with this dunya, grazing like animals, eating, drinking, sleeping, procreating. This is all they do. In fact, Allah describes them, they are like cattle. In fact, they are worse than cattle. They are actually worse than cattle. Because the cattle, brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon you, they at least obey Allah. They confine themselves to that which what Allah has created them to be. Allah has created laws, and Allah has created a sunnah for them, and they follow it. But the human beings? No. We do not confine ourselves to that. Rather, the human beings, they disobey God. They transgress the laws of God. They exceed the limits that Allah has laid down for them through which and by which they should live. So they are worse than cattle. Let us now reflect, brothers, on the reality and sisters, on the reality. What is the truth of this world? It is something that you must remind yourself of again and again and again. Remember what this world is in fact. A moment. A moment. When you stand in front of Allah and when the people they are in front of Allah on the day of judgment and Allah asks them, how long did you tarry? How long did you stay on the earth? What are they going to say? It's like, it was like a day or a part of a day. Your whole life will seem like a day or like a part of a day. Didn't you hear about people who when they're going to die, they say, my life flashed before my eyes. My whole life. That's how your life is like that. That's all your life is. A flash before your eyes. That's it. The longest life you're going to have is going to be short. That's for sure. That is why the Prophet the Messenger of Allah, you see, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he understood the reality. 
He knew the reality of this dunya. He knew, he knew its reality. He understood really what it was about. What do I have to do with this world? It's what the Prophet said. What do I have to do with this world? I'm like a rider. Like a rider who has taken a rest underneath the shade of a tree. And then continues on his journey. Look at this beautiful example. Look at this beautiful example. A man on a journey. Think about it. Especially in those days. Riding on a horse or a camel. A long journey. That is the life. Imagine your existence. Your existence. Not only... Your existence here, but your whole existence. When Allah first created us and took our souls from the back of Adam, this is the beginning of our existence until, and it will go on for eternity. So you imagine it's a long journey. So imagine now you're on a long journey. You're going from, you're going to drive from Melbourne to Where's the long play far away? Brisbane, right? How many thousand kilometers is that? You're going to drive across the continent of Australia. Can anyone do that non-stop by themselves? Keep on driving and get to Brisbane without taking a rest? Mummy. Mummy, did you? <laughs> Super mum. <laughs> Apart from his mum, right? <laughs> <laughs> Apart from his mom, could anyone could anyone do that? Does anyone think they could drive from Melbourne to Brisbane without a break? No, seriously. I don't, well, I, I won't say I don't believe it, but actually I don't believe it. But anyway, <laughs> okay. I don't think you could do it, but maybe you know, maybe if you took some speed or something like that, you know. But I hope no one's going to admit to that, okay. Yeah. What is the likelihood? What do you think would happen if you tried to do that? The likelihood is, brothers, that you would fall asleep at the wheel of your car and you would die. You would fall asleep at the wheel of your car, the car would go off the road and you'd probably be killed. If you're riding in the desert, imagine, on a horse or a camel, a long, long journey, it's going to take you two, three, four weeks to get to your destination. If you don't take a rest, then you will fall off, be left in the desert, and you will die. So when you take a rest underneath the shade of the tree, what are you doing? Uh, the shade, the rest underneath the shade of the tree is you're just stopping to get what you need to continue your journey and reach your destination. Yes? Okay, that's the rest underneath the shade of the tree. The Prophet ﷺ is not saying that this life is about just resting and sitting down and doing nothing. No, what the Prophet ﷺ means that in the life, in this whole life, my existence, what do I have to do with the world? What does a man have to do with what's underneath the tree? He just needs to rest and sleep for a couple of hours under the shade, he gets what he needs, he feels refreshed, he's had his sleep, he's awake again, and he continues on his journey to reach the destination. <coughs> that is the life. That's all you've got to do with it. This world, this dunya is about one single thing. You have to take from this world what you need to reach your destination. That is it. That is the only purpose and the only reason and the only thing we need from this dunya is what you can take and what you need to reach your destination. Yes? So, the destination that we want to reach, where do you want to reach? Which destination do you want to reach? You want to reach the hellfire? Or you want to reach the paradise? Which is the destination that you want to achieve? Okay, anyone else? Just three of you? 
Okay, so where do you want to go? You want to go to hell or you want to go to paradise? Paradise. Okay, inshallah. We want to go to paradise. So there is our destination. Okay? Now, brothers and sisters, any one of you, if you're going to fly to some faraway country, okay? You're going to fly to some... You, you've never been there before. You're going to go to some land, some place that you've never been to, to before. A sensible person is going to start preparing for that. They're going to start finding out what sort of visa do you need. What is the currency? What is the political situation? What injections do I need to save myself from deadly diseases? You're going to make a preparation. If a person just got on the airplane, arrived with no visa, no money, no contacts, no idea, you would say, that person is an idiot. That's what you'd say. And then when he gets there, and he dies of some disease, well, you wouldn't be surprised at all. We want to get to paradise. That is the destination we want to reach. Therefore, this world has one purpose for us. The only purpose of this world is to acquire what we need in order to reach our destination, paradise. If anyone thinks that the world has any other purpose than that, you are deluded. You are delusional. You are completely misunderstanding why you are here. And you need to really examine and think about it. And you need to re-remind yourself what it is about. Because if we really examine what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That Allah is telling us that He did not create us except to worship Him. Nothing else. That is the only reason. We exist only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is only in fact by worshipping Allah alone and abandoning the worship of the false gods, by doing that and through doing that and fulfilling what is the truth of Ubudiyya, servitude to Allah, through this Ubudiyya, through this servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how we gather what we need for our journey so that we inshaAllah will reach the destination that we want which is paradise. That is why we don't have actually, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and if you love Allah, you will follow the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We should be like him. What do we have to do in this world? Nothing except like taking the rest underneath the shade of the truth. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Live in this world like a stranger. Live in this world like a stranger or like a traveller. Huh? I came here to Australia. I said to myself, what do I need for my journey? I need a fold or two. If one gets dirty, better have a clean one. I need some shorts and a t-shirt for bushwalking. Although I found that our brothers are not up to too much bushwalking. Okay? It's more like walking to the kebab shop. It's about as much walking as we get. But anyway, I was hoping. In fact, the brothers did take me for a little walk. Alhamdulillah, it was a little walk. You know? I mean, their legs were creaking the next day. Alhamdulillah, at least they tried. So I packed a few things. What do I do? Take the fridge with me, the kitchen sink, break up my bed and pack it and ship. I'm coming here for a week. What do I do? Pack my whole house and bring it with me? Does that make any sense? No. I'm a stranger. I'm a traveler. And that's how we are in this dunya, brothers. That's how we are in this dunya, sisters. If you're taking the rest underneath the shade of a tree, you don't start building your house there and planting crops and this and that. You're taking your rest and you're going. You take what you need. Right. 
So this is why the Prophet وسلم, he said that the world and everything in it is cursed. Think about it, really. I don't think we, you know, some of these hadith, we hear them again and again, but you know, we don't really think about them. This is very, very sad. We don't have this deep thinking where we sit and really spend three, four, five, six hours thinking just about this hadith or this ayah. Think about it deeply. The world and everything in it is cursed. Take that as the first statement. Everything in this dunya is cursed. What is something that is cursed? The curse of Allah is upon something. That means Allah's mercy has been removed from it. There's no mercy, no blessing, no benefit in it. So this world is cursed. Everything in this dunya is cursed. But then the Prophet وسلم, after this general statement, he made, a few, he made a few exceptions. He said the world and everything is cursed except, except. the scholar, scholar, the scholar of the religion. The scholar of the religion is one thing from this dunya that is not cursed. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the student of knowledge. So the scholar and the student of knowledge and the remembrance of Allah. The remembrance of Allah and what helps you to do that. We have to explain this a little bit. The scholar of the religion, we at least have an idea of what the scholar of the religion. The student of knowledge. The student of knowledge is the person who sits with the scholar, who studies and reads and spends their time and energy studying. This is something, brothers. This is something, sisters. Very few of us do it. And I think less in England, we have lots of deficiencies. But there are quite a lot of people there who do study. They still read and they sit with scholars, but in Australia it's all videotapes and audio tapes and people don't like studying, they don't like reading. Especially, I don't know, in Sydney I heard, the men especially don't like reading. Reading. We have to study. You know, being a student of knowledge is not watching videotapes. No. Studying is what we need. Dedication. Sitting with people of knowledge and learning and going through the books. This is studying just like you do at school or university. This is what we need. This, brothers and sisters, is not studying. This is like, you know, um, what's that drink you've got? The bee drink? You know, with the garawana in it and the, you know, you, you drink it and you feel I had a, a glass of that before I came here today. Okay, you feel all boosted up. This is what it is. This is the drink. This is, this gathering here is a little boost you get. Makes you feel energetic for half a day, a day, you know, and that's it. It's not studying. That is not studying. Don't think that these gatherings constitute knowledge. I mean, it's a type of ma'udha, a reminder. Knowledge means studying, memorizing, learning. We need to do that, all of us, because seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim. You know that. You know that hadith, seeking knowledge, and this means knowledge of the deen, aim of the deen. And then the remembrance of Allah. The remembrance of Allah does not mean, brothers, the dhikr of Allah does not mean as some people think when they sit in a circle and they turn out the lights and they start counting and say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman, and they start you know, doing that together and they start, and eventually go, Allahu, Allahu, and then they start dancing around and, you know, whatever, and, and they call this the circles of dhikr. And this is actually a bid'ah. Can you imagine the Prophet and the Sahaba doing that? Dancing around, saying Allahu and stuff. You know, when I, when I first became Muslim, I used to go to those things. But you know, I sat and thought to myself, could I imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing that? And Abu Bakr and Umar said, Astaghfirullah. That's not the deen, that's not what, that, I can't imagine them doing that sort of thing. This is not dhikr. 
Dhikr actually the scholars define dhikr. Every act of obedience is dhikr. Every act of obedience to Allah is dhikr of Allah. There are different types. Of course to always keep your tongue moist with the tasbih and the takbir and the taslim and so on and so forth. This is one type of dhikr. Or to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dhikr. Or the best type of dhikr is to read the Quran. This is dhikr. These are types, but every, and, and sitting in the gatherings where the halal and the haram is discussed, as Qurtubi, Imam Qurtubi, he mentioned that the gatherings of dhikr are those circles and gatherings of knowledge where halal and haram is discussed, where the laws and the, of the sharia and the stories of the prophets and the righteous people take place without any bid'ah. This is what Qurtubi mentioned. These are the gatherings of dhikr. This is the dhikr of Allah. But in fact, every act of obedience is remembering Allah. I would like someone please to tell me why. Why is every act of obedience to Allah dhikr of Allah? Can someone tell me why? Reality check. Huh? A reality check. No, why is every act of obedience to God dhikr of Allah? Because you need the intention. To Thank that. you very much, brother. Because every act of obedience to Allah has two conditions. Actually three. The first is Iman. The second is Ikhlas. You have to have the intention. And it must be done sincerely and purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third condition is the action has to be correct. It has to be according to the Sharia. It has to be according to the Sunnah. If your action is sincere, but incorrect, it will not be accepted. You could be very sincere. I'm very sincere, I'm selling drugs to raise money for the Mujahideen. <laughs> you could be as sincere as I don't know what, but that action will not be accepted to Allah. Okay? But your action could be absolutely correct. You raise money, you earn halal money, you give it, for the Mujahideen, but why do you give it? Hey everyone, you see? See me? You're giving money to the Mujahideen, you see that? Are you not doing it for Allah? You're doing it because you want everyone to see how charitable you are. So until actions are both sincere and correct, both, they will not be accepted. So as the brother said, every act of obedience to Allah is dhikr of Allah because if it is truly an act of obedience to Allah, you must intend in your heart with a firm resolution that I am doing this to please Allah. Therefore you remember Allah. Yes? Allah. Okay. So this is uh, something that is not cursed. The scholar, the student of knowledge, the remembrance of Allah. And then the Prophet said something else and what helps you to do that? So everything that helps you to remember Allah, everything that helps you to study knowledge or become a scholar, this is also not cursed. So, earning halal money so you can get food to feed yourself with halal food, to help you remember Allah and say your prayers, then alhamdulillah, this is something that is blessed. Or if you earn money to put a roof over your family's head, not taking a mortgage but doing it in a halal way, then this is something that is dhikr of Allah because you are remembering Allah. It helps you to remember Allah, to feed your family, to clothe your family. is something, an act of obedience to Allah. And so on and so on. Even sleeping. If you do it with the intention to sleep, to give yourself energy, to remember Allah, then this itself becomes obedience to Allah. Okay? So, this makes us understand as well, brothers and sisters, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He said, قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَالْمُسُكِ وَالْمَحْيَ وَالْمَاتِ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say that my, my prayer and my sacrifice and my life and my death, it is all for Allah, Lord of the worlds. Everything is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how it should be for the believer. Because otherwise, brothers and sisters, whatever you do that is outside of that, then it is just cursed. 
It has no benefit, no blessing. At the very least, it has no benefit and blessing. At the worst, it's something worse than that. Brothers and sisters, our goal must be paradise. What is this world compared to the next? Let us remind ourselves of just a few things. Sometimes it seems as if this world is all-consuming, but if we just remember and we just think about it, think about this hadith. I want you, you don't live, you don't live in Melbourne, right, far from the sea. Are you far from the sea? How far away is the sea? Half an hour. Brothers and sisters, I want you please to do me, not do me a favor, do yourself a favor. Do it, do yourself a favor and do something. Okay? What you need to do is get a needle. I know you brothers don't know where the needle is. Because unlike the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who used to sew his own clothes. Sorry brothers. But that's the sunnah. If your wives are going to give you a hard time, well it's not my fault. You should study your deen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to sew his own clothes. He used to look after his own affairs in the house. No woman do it! That's not how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. He used to sew his own clothes. So, unlike most of us men, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would know where the needle was. In fact, I'm sure he had his own needle. But if you don't know, brothers, good time to find out. Ask your wife, where's the needle? Because I want to borrow it. In fact, you can make a family trip. Take the needle and go down to the sea. That's what I want you to do. Take a needle and go down to the sea. And then I want you to take the needle and dip it in the sea and take it out. See how much water is left on the needle and then look at the sea. And then remember what the Prophet said. This world compared to the next is as if you took a needle and you dipped it in the sea. And what is left on the needle is this dunya, and the next life is what is the sea. That is the comparison, and do it. Please, I went to the sea the other day, we went for that walk, I looked and I thought about that. And the brother said, why, we, we didn't take a needle with us, right? They said, how about this stick? I said, no, you see, the stick actually will take a lot of water, but a, a needle, the water just comes off. All you've got is a few molecules left. And look at the sea. Look at it. And think that's the akhirah. And this is the dunya. Subhanallah, what is this dunya? Nothing. It is nothing compared to the akhirah. Nothing at all. Subhanallah. And there's another thing I want us to think about, brothers. I know in the newspapers and on the media today, as like so many days, we get to the state when we think, is it ever going to end? Are they ever going to stop attacking us, insulting us? It never seems to stop. But I just want you to think about this. SubhanAllah, when you think about this hadith, it will give you a lot of strength to just keep on going. And it will also make you understand something about reality. If this dunya was worth the wing of a mosquito in the sight of Allah, he would not have let the kafir even drink water. If Allah cared about this world, even to the extent of a mosquito's wing, Allah would not... Look at a mosquito's wing. Can you think of anything, you know, a mosquito, you just squat it, the wing of a mosquito? Allah doesn't care about it even that much. If He cared about it that much, He would not have allowed those people who disbelieve and rebel against Him to even drink water. That's something very important. The Muslims, we forget that. Sometimes we are so into the dunya. We think this dunya is so important. We forget. Allah lets them drink and eat. He gives them power. He gives them strength. Because that's all they're going to have. Because when those people who have rejected their Lord and their Creator, who have insulted Him and rebelled against Him, when they meet Him on the Day of Judgment, they're going to have nothing except hell. So Allah lets them enjoy this life. Allah gives them the power in this life. Allah gives them things in this life. In fact, Allah, He mentioned, if it wasn't for the, the fact that all of mankind would have become like one unit of 
of disbelievers, he would have given them all staircases of silver. The meaning of that is in the Quran. He would have given them all staircases of silver. But then all of mankind will become <coughs> one group of disbelievers. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't care about this dunya. It's nothing. It's our prison and their paradise. But this world is just a moment. A moment for us to earn our reward. A moment for us, and you know the more trials and the more tribulations that we suffer, and as long as we're patient, alhamdulillah, the more our reward, the more chance and opportunity we have to gather what we need to get to paradise. Think of it like that. That's the reality. That's how it is. You go to work to earn money to feed your family. Is working easy? No, it's not. You sweat and you suffer and you strive. But at the end you get something. It's the same. You struggle for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but what you're going to get when you meet Him, alhamdulillah, is going to be tremendous if you did it sincerely and correctly. And that's what this dunya is for, brothers and sisters. This dunya is here for us to take what we need, to get the rewards we need, to do the good deeds, so that when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will be pleased with us, and He will enter into us into paradise. And the angels will say, this is Jannah, which you have got because of what you used to do. What you used to do. And the smallest place, brothers and sisters, in paradise. The smallest place in paradise. For the last person who was taken out of hell, who will come crawling, crawling out of the hellfire. The last person to be taken out of hell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him, Wish, say, ask, ask for what you want, and he will ask. And Allah will say, ask again, and he will ask again. And Allah will say, for you is what you ask, and ten times more. In fact, the last person in paradise will get in the size of the world ten times over of this world. Ten times over the last person. And that is paradise. Paradise, if you have the place of this table in paradise, aside this time, it will, be, it will be better than the world and everything it contains. If, how about everyone else? That, brothers and sisters, is the reality. The reality is the day of judgment. The reality is the paradise and the hellfire. This world is not the reality. This world is just the test, the means to see to determine what are we going to do, what deeds are we going to earn, and those deeds are going to determine where is our ultimate abode. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Our first question tonight, um, first of all, before I um, start answering the questions, I do feel it is important to, if I'm asked a question, I have to really, it's my obligation to explain the answer properly and fully, as best I can. I know some people may find that they would like me to answer the questions quickly and get through more questions but I don't think that's appropriate. I might miss something out or say something uh, wrong, which I'll probably do anyway. If I'm in a hurry it's going to be even more likely and then someone might misunderstand. So this first question actually has been put in front of me. I think the selection has been made for me. We can probably just have a lecture on it but I'm going to try to uh, confine it to a few brief essential points. Anyway, this is the question. All innovations in Islam are sins. 
and result in health. Is making a video and taking pictures bid'ah as well? Because in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were no uh, pictures like that and movies. This is actually a very common question and a common misconception. I have to say, usually, this uh, argument is put forward by people who are themselves innovators. And they do this in order to confuse the minds of people as to the nature of innovation. So, their, their speech goes something like this. All oh, those people who always talk about bid'ah, why don't they stop driving cars and listening to the radio and taking pictures and flying in airplanes because they're all bid'ah as well. And so the person gets confused because linguistically, yes, an airplane is a bid'ah. Linguistically, it's true, a car is a bid'ah because a bid'ah means a new thing, something that wasn't there before and it came along and it wasn't there before, so it's a new thing. So this is from the language what bid'ah means. However, I have to believe that the people who say that from the imams and the so-called scholars are people who really have a very deep sickness in their heart. And that is why the people of Sunnah call them the people of desire. They are the people of desires. They follow Hawa, they follow their desires. Because it's a real sickness they have. Because actually in this mockery they mock the Prophet ﷺ and they make fun and belittle the words of the Prophet ﷺ. Because the Prophet ﷺ himself frequently and often talked about bid'ah, the evil of bid'ah, the danger of bid'ah, very often, in fact, I began my talk the way the Prophet ﷺ used to begin his talks with a type of khutbah or a small saying and in that I mentioned that every thing that is newly introduced into the religion is a bid'ah. This is what I meant, mentioned, and this is what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to mention. Kulla bid'atin dalala. He used to say that all the bid'ah is dalala, wa kulla dalala tin finnar. These are the words the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to repeat over and over again. It must have been something, therefore, very, very important. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if you look to the different narrations when he talked about innovations, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the person who innovates in Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept their deeds until they repent from their innovations. Innovation is something so dangerous and so hated that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that on the day of judgment, and this is the day, brothers and sisters, that the sun is going to be brought one mile away from our heads, where people will be sweating so much that some people will be to their ankles, some to their knees, some to their waist, some people bridle in sweat. Can you imagine how thirsty you are going to be on that day? So after all the trials you're going to face on the Day of Judgment, as a Muslim, alhamdulillah, you are going to head to the Hawd, al kawfa the pond in Paradise. This is a pond that is cooler than snow, whiter than milk, and sweeter than honey. And when you drink from that pond, you will never be thirsty ever, ever, ever again. Now that's a drink you're really going to want. Huh? So the people are going to be coming and, and the Prophet 
he will recognize his ummah because all the people are coming and the Prophet will be keeping away those people who are not from his ummah. And how will the Prophet recognize his ummah? Anyone know? From the, okay, from the marks where we make wudu, we recognize they will shine. And some people will come, like the Prophet mentioned, you know a horse, it has like a white bit on its head, you recognize it like that, it will shine the place where we make wudu. And some people will be coming and the Prophet will recognize them from their marks. And as the Prophet is about to greet them at al kofa the angels will come down and make a barrier between these people and the Prophet <coughs> And the Prophet will say that this is my Ummah, these are my nation, this is my people, he's recognizing them. And the angels will say, Oh Muhammad, you don't know what new things they introduced into the religion after you. <coughs> and the Prophet <coughs> will say, Be gone, be gone with the innovators. Can you imagine such a terrible thing? So this issue of what is bid'ah is not something small. It is very, very serious. The people who introduce new things in the religion are subject to a most horrible humiliation in this life and the next. So it's not a subject we should joke about or make fun of or mock. Because saying things like, all oh, these people who talk about bid'ah, therefore the airplanes are bid'ah, they are mocking bid'ah. <coughs> they are mocking the condemnation of it. And by doing that, they are mocking the Prophet ﷺ. And that is kufr, without a doubt. Didn't the Prophet say, a man, he says a word, and he doesn't realize how bad that word is, and because of it, he goes to the deepest part of the hellfire? what the Prophet said. And the people, as I said, who usually do that are innovators. They're the people who practice innovations. So in order to, instead of ex- trying to explain which they can't justify it, they make mockery of the subject of bid'ah. So now we want to understand what is a bid'ah. As I said, actually, my words were an interpretation of the meaning of the words of the Prophet and They were not an exact verbatim translation. So when I translated the khutbah of Ni, the khutbah of Hajj, when I translated it, then I was giving actually the meaning. So when I said that the worst thing or what the worst of the affairs are the newly introduced matters. And every matter that is newly introduced in the religion, that's what I added. I added in the religion, because that's an explanation actually of what that means. The bid'ah is in religion. The things that have been condemned by the Prophet are clearly the new things that have been innovated into the deen of Islam. And the proofs for this, we have some, we have many proofs for this. That this is what the innovation is restricted to. Not the things of the dunya, like aeroplanes and cars and so on and so forth. These things are not considered or included under the definition of bid'ah. In terms of the sharia. So the bid'ah is in the religious things. So we know from this, from some hadith of the Prophet wasallam. For example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ عَمَلَ مَنْ عَمَلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ أَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ الرَّدِ Whoever introduces into this affair of ours something that is not from it will have it rejected. And this is the important part. The Prophet said, this affair of ours. This affair that, meaning there is an affair that belongs to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whoever introduces into that something that is not from it, and in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that whoever introduces something that we have not approved of, we have not approved of it, it will be rejected. So the matter of worshipping Allah is a matter of guidance from Allah. The only way we can know how to worship Allah is through revelation. That's why I said, the conditions for an action to be accepted are it must be sincere and it must be correct. Correct means according to the Sharia. You can't guess how to worship Allah. 
How do you think the Mushriks started worshipping idols? How did the Christians start worshipping God the way they worship God and start saying that Isa is Allah? How did they come to that? Because they said things and they introduced things and they innovated things and they began to guess for themselves how they should worship Allah. But that was not based upon revelation. So this is when we go astray. When we go astray is when we start adding things and adding new things that are not based upon what Allah revealed. So whoever introduces into this affair of ours something that is not from it will have it rejected. Or whoever introduces into this affair something we have not approved of it will have it rejected. So this is the very important point, this affair of ours. Now what is the proof that the affair of the Prophet is the affair of the deen? The proof is a hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ came across a group of his companions who were fertilizing the date palms. They were cross-fertilizing the date palms, which was their practice they used to do to get the dates that were very thick and strong and good and they would fertilize them okay, in order to increase the yield. And when the Prophet ﷺ, he saw that, he said to them, maybe it's better that you don't do that. So they stopped. So they stopped. And when they stopped, they found that their yield had become less. So when they found that, they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Messenger of Allah, our yield became less. We did what you said, and your you became less. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he said, I am a man. I am a man. And you know about your affairs. So if I give you my opinion about something, if I give you my opinion about something, I'm a man like you, it's just my opinion. But if I tell you something from the deen, something from Allah, then you should accept it. So the Prophet ﷺ himself, he made clear, there is a difference between what, what he said as the messenger of Allah, that it is from the deen, and what people do in their own affairs, that he might give his opinion about it. But it's his opinion, it's not based upon revelation, it's just based upon his opinion. So if it's his opinion, then you have the choice about that. You know your affair as the Prophet said the best. This is the affair. And this shows that the Prophet made a distinction between things that he said, and it was from Allah which we must accept, and the other things of the world which about which we know. Okay? So the Prophet wasallam, and that is why the affair of the Prophet is the matter of the deen of Islam. That is why bid'ah is in the religion. Bid'ah is in the religion, not in the worldly things. Okay? So the prohibition is of introducing new things into the religion. What is the, a good definition of bid'ah is? Something that imitates the sharia. This is very important, brothers and sisters. A bid'ah imitates the sharia. It imitates something from Islam. If it didn't, then it wouldn't be a religious innovation. It wouldn't be in the religion. It's imitating the religion. It's something that's like something from the Sharia. But it is not established by a proof. It is not established by an evidence. Meaning an evidence means what Allah and His Messenger have said. And it's not established by, with a proof either the action itself or the way in which the action is done. Not the action itself, nor the way in which the action is done. Yes? Okay, I want to give you one example now. An example is an incident that happened in the time of the companions after the Prophet ﷺ had died. I think if you understand this, it will help you understand something, you will really understand a lot about Bid'ah. One companion, he was in the masjid. 
And he saw people in the masjid sitting in groups. And they were sitting in circles, and in the middle they had a pile of stones. So in each group there was one man saying, Say La ilaha illallah 100 times, and they would count with the stones. La ilaha illallah 100 times. In another group, a man said, Say Allahu Akbar 100 times, and they would count Allahu Akbar 100 times. In another group, they would count Subhanallah 100 times, like that. So this Sahaba, and I think, I'm, I'm sure it was Abdullah ibn Abbas, I think it was Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was the Sahaba, he went, and he didn't say anything. So the first thing, he's a Sahaba, and Abdullah ibn Abbas is a scholar. He's a scholar from the Sahaba. But, this is the, I'm, I'm adding these things because they're just beautiful things about to, you can learn from this incident. He went to the house of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, was one of the senior Sahaba, one of the early Sahaba to embrace Islam. And he asked the people who were sitting outside the door of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, waiting for him to come out for Fajr. Has Abu Abdurrahman come out yet? And they said, no. This is the other thing. They're sitting, waiting. This is how, look at them, they're waiting for the knowledge. They respect, they don't want to disturb the sheikh, they don't want to disturb him, they're sitting, waiting, and this is how keen they are to get knowledge. Now if a sheikh comes and you advertise it and tell everyone, we're going to have knowledge, we're going to sit and learn, subhanAllah. You know, people, you know, you get a hundred for day one, <coughs> You know, 50 for day 2, 20 for day 3, and for day 4 you've got to like, you know, maybe, I don't know. This is for learning, not like we've got exciting talks like this. Sitting and learning and going through a course, unfortunately, you know, let alone someone going and sitting at his door waiting for him to come out. But anyway, they are sitting waiting. Has Abu Abdurrahman come out yet? No. So he's sitting and waiting. And so when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he comes out, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, Oh Abu Abdurrahman. I saw something in the mosque that, you know, it appeared to me as there was something good in it, but it looked like it was a, an innovation. So, and he said, if you live, you will see it. SubhanAllah. I mean, it's Fajr, you're just going to walk to the mosque. What do you mean if you live? But this is the Sahaba. If you live, you're going to see it, because this is how they thought about death. Not like death is going to come some time far away in the future. We might die between your house and the mosque. This is how the Sahaba thought about death. So if you live, you will see it. So, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he, because Abdullah ibn Abbas had told him and explained him what's going on, he went, into the, he, he hid himself, and he went into the masjid. And so he, when he arrived amongst the people, he you know, made himself known and he said, what is this that you are doing? And they said, oh Abu Abdurrahman, these are stones on which we are counting the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, uh, the taslim and the taqbir and the tasbih and so on and so forth, they said. And before I go on, and to say what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said to them. I want you to think about something. Is it good or bad in Islam to sit in the mosque? It's good. It's good. I'm good. <laughs> Is it good or bad to make dhikr? It's good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So it's good to sit in the mosque and it's good to make dhikr. What were they doing wrong? Sitting in the mosque. Making the Okay, what do you see? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, Oh, this is subhanAllah, these words, subhanAllah, if only the people understood. You will understand about the Muslims today why we are in such a mess. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, Oh, Ummah of Muhammad, how soon you are destroyed. Oh, Ummah of Muhammad, how soon you are destroyed. The clothes of the Prophet have not yet worn out and his pots have not yet broken. I mean, there's still the vestiges of his still, and his companions 
are widespread amongst you. Either you think that you are on better guidance than the guidance of the Prophet, or you have started a wicked innovation. And they said, Oh, Abu Abdul Rahman, we only intended good. You know, we didn't have a good intention. We only intended good. And he said, How many people intend good and never reach it? Verily, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say that a group amongst my ummah will leave Islam in the same way that an arrow leaves the prey. You know, when you shoot the arrow through the prey, it goes straight through. And I don't know that most of you pointing to them are from them. And the narrator of this hadith, and his name was he said that we found most of them fighting with the Khawarij against us at the Battle of Harwani. Brothers and sisters, as I said, what were they doing wrong? They were making dhikr and sitting in the mosque before Fajr. SubhanAllah. But what they were doing wrong is they were making this dhikr in a way the Prophet and his companions never did it. The Sahaba and the Prophet did never, they never sat in circles counting on stones saying, say subhanAllah 100 times, say la ilaha illa, uh, la ilaha illallah 100 times. You see, the act of worship was right. But the way they did it was not the way the Prophet wasallam had taught them. So they had innovated in the religion. And that's why he said, Abdullah ibn Masood, either you think you are on better guidance than the Prophet. Because why would you do something in a way other than the way the Prophet did it? Why would you make dhikr in any other way than the Prophet did? The Prophet used to count on his fingers and he taught us to do that. Why would you do something different? Why would you use beads? Why would you count with stones if the Prophet wasallam didn't do it? You may think, and there are some hadith that talk about using counting with dates and so on and so forth. Actually, these are not authentic hadith. But if you did it thinking they were authentic, fair enough. So you think you're following the sunnah. But preserve, take that aside now. Why would you make dhikr? Or do anything in Islam? Would you, would we, would you accept that we pray six rakah for Isha? Isn't it good to pray more? Is it good to pray more or not? Generally. But you can't add to the Isha prayer, can you? Another two rakah. You have to do it the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. Yes? You make wudu, okay, and you add, you know, rubbing your tummy. Can you do that? No, you can't. And even little things, for example, it seems to be little, but when someone sneezed, he said, Alhamdulillah, As-salatu as-salam ala Rasulullah. And when Abdullah ibn Umar, he heard this, he said, No, we were not taught this. We were taught by the Prophet that when you sneeze, you just say, Alhamdulillah. He didn't accept it, that you should add something. And actually, we could give many, many examples from the Sahaba, from the Imams, the four Imams, where similar things they criticized it and condemned people adding something and doing things in the way that the Prophet ﷺ did not do it. This is what we mean by an innovation. Therefore, we should stick to those things which the Prophet ﷺ did in terms of the acts of the ibadah. Now, someone may have another question. So I have to finish this. So I want to clear it properly. And they would say, well, how about the compilation of the Qur'an. That was not done by the Prophet Someone may say, well how about the books of Hadith? That was not done by the Prophet, they were not compiled. And how about the books of Arabic grammar? Isn't that part of our religion? And we would have to say yes, and we might be stuck now, okay? But we're not stuck, alhamdulillah. Because we have to understand some things, okay? We have to understand. There are some things that are necessary 
from the Sharia. It's necessary from us. The Sharia necessitates it for us. By necessity, we meet in a time of... Okay. It's very easy to really examine and find out what is really a bid'ah or not. It's actually quite easy. You just have to apply a few simple tests. Okay? And these are the tests. The first thing we want to ask is, this action, this thing that the people are doing, did they have the capability and the technology and the means to do this thing in the time of the Prophet ﷺ and if they had the means and the ability to do it and they never did it and the Prophet never told them to do it and we do it, then definitely it's a bid'ah. For example, did they have the means and the ability to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ in the lifetime of the Prophet? Yes or no? They did. Did they ever do it? They didn't. Okay? They did not. The Sahaba, the Prophet never ordered the people to celebrate his birthday and his companions never celebrated his birthday. How about counting with beads? I'm the love of seeing beads and all. How about counting with the beads? Okay? Did they have the technology to put some beads together on a piece of string? You think they could do that? Yeah. Did they do that? Yeah, yeah. Apart from if you think maybe there are some hadith, if you think there are some hadith that's different. But let's just presume those are weak hadith is what I believe. So therefore, how if they could have done it, the Prophet could have told them to do it. The Sahaba could have easily have done it. There's nothing preventing them, nothing prevented them from doing it. So therefore to do these things definitely is a bid'ah. Without doubt. Okay? But there are some things that they could have done, and they have the technology to do it, but there's something that prevented them from doing it. And I'm going to give you an example. The example of this is the compiling of the Qur'an in one mushaf. Did they have the technology to write and put it together as a thing? They did. They did. But there was something preventing them from doing that while the Prophet was alive. Can anyone tell me what was preventing them from doing that? Yeah. The revelation was still coming. There was still a Quran was still being revealed. So how could they compile the whole Quran while the Quran was still being so something prevented them from making one mushaf? That that was the Quran was still being revealed. But when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, then that was not there anymore. So they were not prevented anymore from doing that. And there's another thing. There's something that in the time of the Prophet, they had absolutely no need for it whatsoever. They didn't even need it. For example, do you think they needed books of Arabic grammar in the time of the Prophet Did they? Of course not. They knew and spoke and understood Arabic. There are some things, brothers, that they didn't need it in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Like books of Arabic grammar. But when Islam spread to many lands and to many people who didn't speak Arabic, then did they need that to preserve the religion, to understand the religion? Sure they did. Like the bow marks on the Qur'an. When the people were not used to reading and they couldn't understand exactly, this became very necessary to add those marks to preserve the correct recitation of the Qur'an. So these, and the compiling of the books of Hadith and the books of Fiqh and those types of things that sure they are part of our religion, but the need was not there in the time of the Prophet or in the time of the Sahaba. But the need for those things came later. So we don't call those things bid'ah because that is something that is necessary to preserve the Sharia, to preserve the Islam. Okay? So if we can apply those three tests and we can ask ourselves, then alhamdulillah, we could become very clear about what things are or constitute a bid'ah and what does not constitute a bid'ah even in the religion. Okay, so I hope that really answers that question, inshallah.
too long after what I just said. Take him and whip him. <laughs> is, is, that's what we should do when the mobile phones go off during the Salah. Really, I think people should be whipped. I think they should. I'll tell you a story. I can't resist it. In Ramadan, in Taraweh, in one mosque in London, the Imam, mashallah, is leading the prayer, and subhanAllah, one mobile phone in the mosque, in the middle of the prayer, dee, 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 like this. You know the Arabian Nights tune, right? So this goes on and on and on. So the prayer finishes, everyone's looking around, who was that, okay? The next two rakah starts. Dee, 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 Everyone's, subhanAllah, this and that, and everyone's really, really upset. In fact, I think the Imam even got so confused, he prayed one rakat instead of two. <laughs> Everyone was distracted. The next two rakat. <laughs> really, the life, I think it's shaitan, you know, but whatever. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And I'm realizing that this sound is coming from somewhere really close to me. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> so I'm looking around and whatever, and I see this guy looking at his mobile phone. Okay? I said, brother, was that you? He said, no, 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 it wasn't me. And I saw on the face of this thing, three missed calls. <laughs> I said, wallahi, yeah, that's disgusting. I was so, I was shaking. I took his mobile phone and I chucked it out of the window from the mosque. Next to the car. Dearly! <laughs> from outside the mosque. Right? At least we all had the pleasure of seeing that guy having to dig his mobile phone out of the bushes. <laughs> so, yes, I think we need some serious sort of whipping for people who leave their mobile phones. Then we, inshallah, I think we'll remember to turn our mobile phones off. Allah, you have to think, brothers, if you're going to disturb everybody who's praying, subhanAllah, what sort of punishment could come to you for that? Think about it. SubhanAllah. Really, fear Allah about these mobile phones. Destroying the khushur of people in the prayer. SubhanAllah. It's really very, very bad thing. Really. I don't know how that came up, but anyway. It's, <laughs> anyway, it's connected, I think. It's all music haram. <laughs> Double question mark. What is wrong if some sweet scientific music soothes our mind? What is sweet scientific music? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Mama, what is, I'd love to know what sweet scientific music is. The sound of whales? What if it's the sound of whales? It's not music. If it's whales, go, <laughs> it's not music or birds. Singing, how good is that? Nothing wrong with that. You know, that's beautiful. It's good. Actually, I used to have. What? <laughs> Record that. Play it back. Soothe your mind. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with that. I used to actually have. I used to have a record with like sounds of frogs and things and from a swamp in Florida. <laughs> yes. It's like that. <laughs> so, alhamdulillah, that sort of thing is, if that's what you mean, alhamdulillah, no problem with that. But if it's like music, no music really, it's haram. Really, it's haram. Okay, and, and I'm sure with most people must have gone through so many times the uh, why the music is haram. You know, there's many reasons. Actually, we have proof from the Quran, from the Sunnah. Actually, the Quran, not exactly, but from, it is really, but from the tafsir of certain ayat of the Quran, that this is talking about music. Okay, that they exchange the revelation for Allah, they, they sell the revelation of Allah, they exchange it for the vain talk. And Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Wallahi, it's music, Wallahi, I think it was Abdullah ibn Abbas, Wallahi, it's music. Okay, so this is a, a tafsir of a sahabi about this ayah. This is really to understand what does this verse mean. I, that's a proof from the Quran that music is forbidden. 
And we have actually authentic hadith and some people say, oh, they use, they refer to Ibn Hazm, and they say this hadith and that one is, no, that there's a, a very authentic hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that mentions that one of the signs of the day of judgment is that people will make music halal. They will make it halal. So we see that taking place in front of our eyes because don't you hear people making the music halal? Which means how can they make it halal if it wasn't haram? It's haram. So that's a very clear evidence in Sahih Bukhari. You don't need anything other than that. Oh, this one's cutting out too. Okay, so inshallah I think that's one of the proofs that the music is haram. The brother is cutting out again. Okay, brother, I went to visit a Muslim family, and if the family offered me food that's not halal, do I have to eat it? Of course not. You don't eat it. It's on. No, you don't eat food that is not halal. That's it. Short Can you please explain a little about how we should change our lifestyle to suit our deen and not vice versa? E.g. praying on time and letting go of our worldly things for a moment to pray. This is, subhanAllah, you know, this is another one of those, you know, very deep questions. You know, we, so we could make that a, good, a lecture, really. But this is really what we have to say is this whole uh, question is talking about your fear of Allah. Do you fear Allah really? What does it mean to be a Muslim? It's all connected with your Iman, with your belief in Allah, with your thinking about the Akhirah. Really for a person who is remembering death all the time, who is thinking about the Day of Judgment, who is thinking about the Paradise, who is thinking about the Hellfire, then this is not an issue. Because for them the most important thing, without any doubt, is to pray. And this is really, brothers and sisters, what you need to aim for. I always tell people who are newly converted to Islam, and we got a lot of them in Regent's Park Mosque, nearly every week, one or two people, alhamdulillah, they're coming, they're coming Muslim. Alhamdulillah, sometimes more, maybe sometimes less, but on average. And alhamdulillah, I get to talk to quite a few of them. And one of the things I say, look, now you're Muslim, you have to pray five times a day. But you, it should be like this. It is not about fitting your prayer into your life. You know, here's my life, how can I fit the prayer into my life? Oh, a little bit, I can fit it in there. No, you know what it should be? You fit your life around your prayer. It's like, okay, here's my Duhar prayer. Now, how am I going to fit my life around that? Here's Asr prayer. How am I going to fit my life around that? That is the way you should be thinking. Your prayer comes first and your life comes next. Well, actually, prayer is life. I really think prayer is life. The rest of the stuff is not life. The prayer is the life. That doesn't mean you give up working. That doesn't mean you give up studying. But your mentality should be that. Your, your way of thinking should be that. I love when I see brothers getting nervous. I love it. When they get nervous and they start saying, the usher time, the usher, you know, it's not even, they got like an hour, two hours left, but you know, it's the bad time, the makruh time, you know, the time when it's getting yellow, it's not right to leave the usher for that time. You should pray before in the earliest time. SubhanAllah, I was going through al kabair by al dhahabi I was going through that book in a circle I'm doing in England, and I went through, subhanAllah, it was, I, it was an enlightenment for me, I went through the section on not praying. And in there he was mentioning that the verses that talk about the people who are leaving the prayer does not mean the people who abandon the prayer, it means the people who leave the prayer from the earliest time. SubhanAllah, that actually leaving the prayer and delaying the prayer is a major sin. SubhanAllah, I was shocked. I mean, I knew that leaving the prayer was a major sin, but delaying it constantly and making it a habit from its earliest time and its proper time, SubhanAllah, this is a sin. So the issue of the prayer is very, very serious. Very, very serious. 
In fact, I really believe, I really believe, brothers and sisters, if you want to make your Islam right, make your prayer right. Really. If you want to make your Islam right, that's my experience. Not that I'm saying my Islam is, you know, right. But that's my experience is that the thing that changed my life was when I started praying five times a day and when I made the prayer the cornerstone of my day. And then I found that everything else, alhamdulillah, came with that. And not only saying it on its time, but making it properly with the bowing and the prostrating, doing it with calmness, praying with khushur, this is all part of the correctness of the prayer. Believe me, concentrate on that and you will see how your life will automatically change. Try it. And see. So, I think that is a good way to try and make your life and change your lifestyle is by concentrating on your prayer, make your prayer right, inshallah, you will see how your life will become right. In this country, some brothers have the right intention to work to provide for their family. However, aspects of their employment are against the worship of Islam, e.g. meeting along with women, being in a private room with a woman, etc. Please advise on solution according to Islam. But there is no doubt at all that being alone with a woman is forbidden. The third of you is going to be shaitan. And shaitan will go from you and whisper into her what you would like to do with her and from her what she would like to do with you. Okay, this is what will happen. You sit in a, ro a, ro a, a room alone with a woman. It's forbidden to do that. It is forbidden. There's no doubt. And it is a very it is a door to zina, it's a door to fornication. And you must do everything to avoid such a situation. You must do everything to avoid such a situation. But the fact is like many, many things, I, I have to say this, uh, you know, but this is the fact. Like many things, we have to weigh up the benefits and the harms. We have to do that. So it may be a situation, in fact, that the harm of you not doing that would be something great. To your life, to your family, to your job. Now, being alone with a woman is not a major sin. It's a sin, it's a door to evil, it's something very dangerous, but it is not a major sin like drinking alcohol or actually fornicating or something like that. So you have to sometimes weigh the benefits. You shouldn't, you know, I've, it's like, the problem is if I say this, some people would just take it as an excuse. But all we can say is fear Allah. Fear Allah. What can we say? You must fear Allah. You have to have the fear Allah. You fear Allah as much as you can. You do the best you can. But it is true sometimes you will get in a situation where that might be difficult to avoid. You do your best to avoid it. But if it's something where you're always sitting in the room alone with a woman and that's something that happens all the time, I would have to say you should change your job. Because that is a very, very big door to evil. A very big door. To sit alone the whole time, the whole day, every day, with a woman? No. I mean, if it happens once, for something that is brief or something you can't avoid it, then even you should try, but you have to wait. You have to wait. The evils and the goods, this is what you have to do. Okay? And that's something you're going to have to be doing really a lot, actually. Through many different things. So, Allah wa I, I don't want to mention some things I heard some scholars say, actually, something more than that. But I, sometimes I get afraid if you say something, you're going to make excuses and brothers are going to take it as an open door to do things. Okay? So, the thing is, brothers, avoid these things as much as you can. That's my advice that I would like to give you that. Muslims must be interested in dunya because we live here. We must uh, ensure that dunya is in peace so we can remember Allah. Fine. No problem with that. Because I said that what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not what I said, what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, or the meaning of what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, 
is that everything in the world is cursed except the scholar and the student of knowledge and the remembrance of Allah and what helps you to do that. So whatever helps you to remember Allah, it's not cursed. Yes? So the brothers asked me, for example, okay, how about I want to take my wife for, you know, a drive and we want to go out somewhere and go on a holiday or what? Is this something? Well, you know, mashallah, if you take your wife out and she gets happy, right? She won't be nagging you so much and it will help you to remember Allah a lot. <laughs> so, no, seriously. You know, not inshallah, it's not like that. But what I mean is that yes, of course, that is something that is helping you to remember Allah. In fact, even relaxing. Sometimes you relax. The Prophet ﷺ himself used to love to go to the gardens, the green place, he used to love to go and sit there. Because even, you know, everybody, I don't think anyone can sit and read and study and study and study non-stop. Very, very, very few people. Very few people can be in that state all the time. Most of us, we have a limit. And we need to take a break. And if we take a break, with the intention that this break is going to give us more energy to return to our ibadah with more concentration, then this break itself becomes something that helps us to remember Allah. Yes? But that shouldn't be an excuse that, you know, I'm taking a, break, a permanent break, you know, and I remember Allah like a few minutes here and there. I mean, you know, again, the Allah brothers and sisters, you know. So these type of things, alhamdulillah, this is something that is going to help you remember Allah. Allah <laughs> what does the beard mean in Islam? The beard is one of the aspects of the fitrah. This is one of the things from the natural disposition, the way, the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us upon. So therefore, to take off the beard for the man is destroying and uh, uh, perverting the fitrah. In fact, the scholars considered to completely remove the beard altogether, mutilation. This is what the imams, they considered the imams of sunnah, the, the, imams, the imams of the madhahib, they considered to be mutilation. Removing the beard. Completely. Okay? So, or, or removing it to even the extent that it's not recognizable as a beard. So the beard is something that has been ordered by the Prophet ﷺ. It's not like the people say it's a sunnah or it's musta'ab or it's uh, mandub or... No, the beard is something you have to do it. Shaving the beard is haram. It is haram. The Prophet ﷺ ordered the growing of the beard and the trimming of the moustache. And there's one hadith, I, I think it's in Sahih Muslim, I'm not sure exactly, when some Magians, some people from Persia, they came to the Prophet with a message from the Persian ruler. And they used to have big moustaches and no beards. And when the Prophet saw, he turned away. He couldn't look at them. He said, who ordered you to do that? They said, our Lord, meaning the, the, the Persian Emperor. And the Prophet said, my Lord has ordered me with something better than that. Grow the beard and trim the moustache. So this really indicates the obligatory nature of growing the beard. It is part of what defines the man. That is why the scholars of the past, they used to consider shaving the beard effeminate, a sign of imitating women. Okay, it's not permissible to do that. In fact, the men who imitate women and the women who imitate men are cursed, as you know. So these are some of the evidences the scholars use. And if you want, you can go and check this information. Don't take my word for it. Go and check it. Go and check what the scholars of the past used to say. And I'm talking about what the Prophet said, what the Sahaba used to believe about this, what the four Imams. It's amazing how many people say, I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Maliki, I'm a Shafi, I'm a Hanbali. Yet, really, they don't follow hardly anything of what Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi. In fact, they'd be shocked when you bring them what Imam Shafi or Imam Malik really said. They'd be absolutely shocked. Because what they're following is not that at all. It's just claims from them. In fact, what you find most people are following are some customs and traditions and things that they've got used to and fala, fala, and fala, and fala, and this and that, and that's it. Yes,
Um, when you grow the beard, um, is it okay to, like, uh, to move it up, like make it neat? That's a good question. Or just all I know, what all I can say is that you should at least grow the beard, and it should be identifiable as a beard. You should not post shave. This is the scholars consider this mutilation. However, is it what is really the correct? What I can say definitely we know is what is correct is that the Prophet anyway he said let the beard grow, and actually there's no evidence to show that the Prophet sallallahu said or allowed directly from the Prophet. There's no direct evidence to allow trimming the beard. But we do find many, many Sahaba. We have quite a few narrations, including Ibn Umar. And Ibn Umar, as we know, was very strict in following the Prophet ﷺ to the extent that he, even if he was on a, a, a road or a place and the Prophet turned his camel around, Ibn Umar would turn his camel around there. That's how strict he was. And he is known to have taken and cut his beard after a fistful in Umrah and actually there are some narrations when he did it at other times as well. And there are other companions who are known to have done that. And that would be sufficient in fact to establish an evidence that because we understand the Sunnah with the understanding of the companions. In the same way we understand the Quran through the Sunnah, we should understand the Sunnah through the companions because they live with the Prophet and they were the ones who were there when the revelation was revealed. They saw the Prophet ﷺ pray. It's very important to refer to their understanding. And from that, I have heard the opinion, even one scholar, he actually said, you must trim the beard. And one scholar he actually said, you must. But Allah, I really can't feel comfortable that that is strong, okay? But certainly, we, without doubt, it is permissible to trim the beard after a fiscal. No doubt, it's permissible to do that. Do yeah? people who are not Muslim and uh, have never heard or learnt about Islam have a chance of entering paradise? Okay. And what was the purpose of their life on this earth? Thank you. And okay. My last comment. I won't be that at the end. Okay. So. If people who have never heard about Islam, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that some people will come before Allah on the Day of Judgment and they will say, one of them will say, I came in a time when there were no Prophets. Another one will say, I was too senile, I was old, too old to understand what was being said. And the other one, I don't remember, was either died as a child or another one was insane. Anyway, these are some people or categories of people who will have an excuse that they didn't understand and they couldn't follow Islam because they had no capability to acknowledge that. So Allah on the day of judgment will send them a messenger. He will send them a messenger. And the messenger will tell them that if you go to the hell fire, Allah will make it cool for you. So whoever obeys the messenger, then they will go to paradise. And whoever disobeys the messenger, they will go to hell. And from that we learn another important point for all of us. Messengers are sent to be obeyed. Not merely to be believed in, but to be obeyed. That what they ordered us to do, we should do it. Okay? So Allah will judge everybody justly on the Day of Judgment. People who never heard about Islam, Allah will deal with them justly. As for what is the purpose of their life, Allah has still given them fitra. And Allah has still given them aqal. He still gave them intelligence and He still gave them the natural disposition. He still gave them the ability to think and to contemplate. But this is Allah's mercy. Allah is not going to punish them. And so they still have with those, they could do something to get close to Allah and to worship Allah. But because Allah is so merciful, He said that He does not punish a people until He sends a messenger, messenger to them. This is Allah's mercy. SubhanAllah, He could punish us anyway. Really, Allah gave us enough intelligence and enough fitrah to know that He is only one and that we should not worship anything except Him. But Allah is so merciful that He will not punish until He sends a messenger. SubhanAllah. Okay, that's it. We'll leave it and make it the last one. Please, brother, ask people to ask <laughs> okay.
one may weigh you on the other side. Okay, I, okay, brothers. Alhamdulillah, I have to say, brothers and sisters, I have been invited, I was invited here by IDCA, a group of brothers who I've spent a few days with in Sydney. I could say lots of things about them, <laughs> good things, alhamdulillah, you know, about what good walk, walkers they are and stuff like that, you know. But um, brothers, these brothers, mashallah, these brothers and sisters in Sydney, well, alhamdulillah, they are really, subhanallah, what I found about them is how they are working for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help the Muslims. And I found, mashallah, how they are, many good characteristics I could mention about them, many. The best of which is, I found them from what I could see, firm and hanging on to the two hot coals. Hanging on to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Like strangers amongst the people. But what kind and beautiful strangers. Not harsh, not hard-hearted, but soft and gentle. People slander them, people attack them, and I found them only forgiving and overlooking, and just nothing with wanting good for the people. You know, here in Melbourne, and it's in Sydney the same thing. You know the condition of the youth. You know what it's like. You know about the drugs. You know about the prostitution. You know what is happening to our brothers and sisters. Stories that, you know, make you really sick to your stomach to hear about it. The brothers are trying so hard to build and to get a center. A center where in their area? Auburn, 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 Auburn. 40,000 Muslims in Auburn. No center for them. 40,000 Muslims, no center. The one mosque they've got, the council has prevented them from praying Fajr and Isha. When the brothers phoned me, I was physically feeling upset. I started saying, you should go to court and you should this and that. And said, brother, it's not possible. It's impossible. What's happened? I was feeling so angry. I was thinking in my mind, what can we do? And although I'm so busy in London in the Central Mosque, I said, that is it. I am going to come to Australia even if they sack me. I don't care. I'm coming because I have to help these brothers out. Alhamdulillah. That's really how I felt about it. So brothers and sisters, the way you can help them out is they need $1.3 million. That's what they need to buy the center. They don't want to put down the deposit because they know people who have tried to do that and lost seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. We don't want to waste the Muslims' money. Okay? Brothers, please, sisters. Brothers and sisters, and I say the sisters, you know, they end up being sometimes so much more generous. Please, I'm asking you, donate generously to them. They have got until March. Only until March to raise the money. They've got some way, but they've still got a long way to go. You can donate, you can give your money, you can give pledges. Please help them, brothers and sisters. Please help them. You know, and when you go to visit in, in Sydney, the brothers will be there and you see it's beautiful. Alhamdulillah, what they're trying to do. And Alhamdulillah, what you've got here, you're very lucky. MashaAllah, in Melbourne, you're very lucky. You've got Abu Hamza here. MashaAllah, good luck after you. Alhamdulillah. And, and the brothers at, uh, at Isna, subhanAllah, who I love them all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for my times coming here, mashallah. And we've got these beautiful brothers now in Sydney trying to do the same sort of thing. Please, we know what you're like here. We know you're a great community. We have lots of hope, inshallah, that you're really going to help them. Okay? So please, brothers, sisters, be really generous. Please give them, please help them. We need to raise this money. We need this center. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.